brains deteriorate with age, what exercises for the brain have demonstrated either slowing or reversing some of this natural process? Yeah, so th this is really interesting. So there, there are great data from uh, the Nobel Prize winning uh, neuroscientist Eric Kendall's lab at Columbia showing that when we do certain forms of exercise, there's a hormone-like molecule that's released into the blood bloodstream called osteocalcin. Osteocalcin um, is known to provide support to neurons in a brain area called the hippocampus, which is involved in learning and memory. Um, the 150 to 180 minutes of zone two cardio per week will support overall brain health and function by way of improving blood flow. So a lot of cognitive dysfunction is um, over time and, and age related dementia is just poor perfusion of the brain. This is why people who have general cardiovascular issues also generally have issues um, with thinking. Uh, quite honestly, sleep apnea is also a major problem. Fix sleep apnea by taping your mouth shut and becoming a nose breather at night. That's the best way. People, again, the excess weight issue is not just fat weight. It also is muscle weight. So this is also why bodybuilders are always dropping dead. A lot of them are just asphyxiating themselves in sleep, which is terrible, but that's a niche population. But for most people, not sleeping on your back and, and not carrying too much weight in the neck and in the torso is going to be helpful. Um, now, in terms of brain function, a couple of things I um, just want to mention before I forget. One of the, the ways to improve cognitive function is to make sure that there's a, appropriate amounts of lymphatic clearance. The brain has its own lymphatic system. This lymphatic clearance happens during sleep. One way to enhance it is to have the feet slightly elevated, 10 to 15 degrees. I put a pillow under my ankles when I sleep at night. Usually I, in the middle of the night, I realize I kicked it away or something like that. But feet elevated naps of about 10 to 15 degrees are very useful. It increases the lymphatic clearance. There's beautiful data to support um, lymphatic clearance as an important process. Now, in terms of exercise, exercise during the day increases the rates of lymphatic clearance at night. So the reason I mention this is that these are indirect effects on lymphatic clearance and blood flow. Now, what about direct effects? The direct effects bring us to osteocalcin. And the direct effects of exercise on brain function and health actually come from stimulation of the skeleton and load bearing exercise. And this is something that I think is underappreciated. When we do cardiovascular work, again, you support blood flow, lymphatic clearance, but osteocalcin is made by the bones. Wow, a hormone that's made by bones that's released into the bloodstream and then goes to the brain and improves brain function. And how does this work? Well, when the skeleton has load, load bearing, um, it is load bearing, then osteocalcin is released and it makes perfect sense. Why would the brain continue to support its own function if the body isn't being used? Well, you could say, how does the brain know that the body is being used? The body knows that uh, the brain, excuse me, knows that the body is being used for load bearing work because osteocalcin is that signal. Again, the brain and body have to communicate. And it's not like the body says, oh, I weight trained today or I did um, calisthenics today. No, it doesn't work that way. There's a hormone signal to communicate that to the brain. So this can be achieved a number of different ways. I actually think body weight exercises can be quite good. Um, there are a couple of online sources that, I mean, I think the incredible work that Ido Portal is doing, I-D-O Portal, he's big on this movement. He calls it movement culture, but this is, he's a, in, he's a phenom, but you know, not just doing push-ups and, and burpees and not that sort of thing, which are very linear, but a lot of non uh, dynamic, nonlinear movement. He talks about explosiveness, suppleness, um, but at a basic, in basic form, people doing push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, dips, um, you know, uh, jump squats, you know, basic load-bearing um, behaviors. It's actually well established that cognitive function in aging can be assessed indirectly by grip strength. Now, why would that be? You have lower motor neurons, which are neurons in your spinal cord that control contraction of the muscles that by releasing neurotransmitter onto those muscles, but you have upper motor neurons, which control deliberate motor action and grip strength is something that really involves those upper motor neurons. And um, you actually can do this as a, as a test that if you're lifting weights, if you um, grip really strong, let's say you're even doing a unilateral movement. If you clinch the opposite fist really, really hard, you'll find that you can move more weight for more repetitions because you're engaging the entire upper motor neuron to lower motor neuron system. So there's a chain of neural events there. So the idea is that people should be doing three to four days a week minimum, but 
when you say minimum, there isn't much more room for upper upper limit, but three to four days a week of some sort of load bearing exercise that could be weight training with machines or free weights, but it could also again be push ups, pull ups, dips, um, jump squats. The ability to jump and grip strength are highly correlated with cognitive function later in, in age. You think, why would that be? Again, it's these hormonal signals sent from the body to the brain. Now, will doing a bunch of load bearing exercise make you smarter? Probably not. In fact, we, we probably both know examples of people that do a lot of exercise, but aren't, aren't um, uh, thought of as, as the swiftest um, folks cognitively that you obviously still have to learn stuff. And we talk about how to learn better. Um, but when you do this three or four days a week of resistance exercise, you are providing a signal from the body to the brain to not just maintain, but to build your cognitive capacity. And I think that the over, uh, that, you know, the overwhelming amount of evidence has been placed on cardiovascular exercise and improvements in the brain, even so much so that people have um, focused on, there's some mouse data or studies published on, on mice showing that exercise, cardiovascular exercise can um, increase the number of neurons in the hippocampus. turns out that's true for mice, but not for humans. I wouldn't focus so much on adding new neurons to the brain. It's more about getting the ones that you have to already be, um, to be more functional. And I think that one of the reasons why so much of the work was done on cardiovascular exercise is very easy to make mice uh, run on a wheel. They love to run on a wheel, harder to get them to lift weights. If you want mice to do load bearing exercise, they actually do these kind of cruel experiments where they actually make a limb deficient so that they can I have to hobble around on another limb to overload that limb. Nowadays, the techniques have gotten better to do sorts of these um, studies on humans. Um, and just one more incentive for doing load bearing exercise. There's a beautiful paper published this last year showing that when people do resistance exercise, a little what's called a micro RNA, um, which are little tiny RNAs, as the name suggests, actually are released in little vesicles, little bubbles from the muscle and travel to the body fat and help facilitate burning of body fat. So resistance exercise has obviously effects on caloric burn that can indirectly support fat loss in states of, you know, subcaloric intake, but resistance exercise itself facilitates lipolysis, the usage of body fat for energy. So, so many reasons to both do cardiovascular work, 150 to 180 minutes a week minimum, and to do three to four days a week of resistance exercise. And it doesn't have to be excruciatingly hard or heavy. It does have to be um, effort, but it pays off through this osteocalcin system.